It's great to be here. And uh, hey, before we start, and I don't even know if Andre's in here or not, but why don't we just give a big round of applause to Andre and his whole crew. These guys, I just enjoy the worship every Sunday. And you, you have no idea what goes into what the time they give. Um, literally, before two seconds before the service went up, the projector went down. So there was all kinds of stress going on. And I mean, these are people that are just giving their time. And uh, they don't do it for the thanks, but it's good to thank them every once in a while. So thank you guys for everything you do. Hey, so I'm sure you guys are all really fired up to talk about finances this morning, right? It's always a fun topic. Thank you. I don't get a lot of cheers about that. Um, but as Pastor Anthony said, we are in this series called Stuck, and we're in our second week, and we're trying to look at things that hold us down and make us stuck and keep us from being successful in our finances, but more importantly, becoming the stewards that God wants us to be and calls us to be. So last week, if you were here, you might remember that Pastor Gay um, spoke about contentment, or more importantly, our lack thereof. And how our discontentment often makes us become stuck because we're so focused on the things we don't have or the things that we want and we start to follow those desires and quite frankly we make idols out of all these things and it takes us further and further away from where God would have us be with our finances. So this week we want to talk about another thing that we believe can make us stuck and it's perspective. And what I mean by that is we often have the wrong perspective when it comes to our finances. And the difference of perspective is subtle, but it makes all the difference in the world. It's the difference between being an owner and being a steward, right? And let me just give you an example about what I mean when we talk about stewardship. I don't know if any of you in this room have ever been a babysitter or have hired a babysitter. Um, My wife and I actually had a longstanding dinner commitment last night And we had to hire one last night, so we're very well versed in this. Um, But anybody who's hired a babysitter or been a babysitter knows exactly what I'm talking about when I talk about being a steward, right? A steward is entrusted, okay, with helping bring about the desired outcome of someone else, right? You take part in helping bring about the desired outcome that someone else has. So if you're a parent, you have a desired outcome that your kids are safe, right? That they go to bed on time, those kinds of things. And you're entrusted with the kids to bring that about. Quick story. Um, I don't do a lot of babysitting in my life. I have three kids. I watch them. I'm reasonably good at it. Um, But I don't call that babysitting. I often don't get asked to watch other people's kids. Well, a few years ago, my wife's aunt passed away, unexpe- well, not unexpectedly, but kind of sooner than we had expected, and um, my wife and I went up to Toronto to go to the funeral. We had left our kids at home, so we had a lot of freedom in what we were doing while we were there, um, and so we weren't tethered by what our kids needed or the like. So the night before the funeral, there was a viewing and a memorial uh, service and really a time for the family to gather and have dinner. Um, and kind of hang out and share stories. And because it kind of had come up so quickly, my sister-in-law and brother-in-law, who we were staying with, hadn't planned and hadn't gotten a babysitter, right? And suddenly it occurred to them, we might have to stay home and miss this, you know, viewing um, to to be with the kids. Because they didn't want their kids to have to go through two full days of of kind of funeral things. So I realized fairly quickly, as, you know, just a great in-law that I am, that it's more important for the niece to be at her aunt's funeral than it is for me, right? So I said, you know what, guys, you go. I'll stay with your kids. And they said, really, is that that okay? I said, yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I've got some kids at home. I know what I'm doing, no problem. And they said, okay, good. You watch the kids. That's great. We really appreciate it. You can have dinner at this time. Um, They can go to bed around 8.30, you know, just try to give them, you know, a little heads up when it's time, but, you know, basically keep them alive, right? That's, That's the general mantra of most babysitters. And so I said, no problem. So they left. We're, I'm hanging out with my, uh, my nephew and my two nieces. We're having a good time. We're watching some TV, playing some games. I actually got the dinner together, which was left for me to do for them. Pretty impressive, I thought. And um, so after, you know, a while, they're getting kind of bored. And they said, we're going to go upstairs and play. And I said, yeah, no problem. You know, go ahead. So they went upstairs. And they were being really, really good. I mean, they're not yelling, they're not screaming, they're being really quiet. I actually sat down, got a book out, 
was kind of hanging out. I said, man, I didn't expect to have any alone time, you know, tonight while I'm babysitting. They're being so good. But it's about a half hour before bedtime. So I said, all right, well, they're being good. I'll, leave, I'll let them go. So I get into my book, and time kind of gets away from me, right? Because they're being so good. I'm not even paying attention. I look down, and I'm like, holy cow, I got to get them ready for bed. I mean, they're, they're so quiet. I had no idea. Boy, these are good kids. I said, I better go upstairs and give them a five-minute warning, right? Because for some reason, that works, right? You give them a warning, and I don't know why that makes it easier. But so I go up the steps to give them a five-minute warning, and as you come up the steps in their center hall colonial, there's bedrooms all around, and the bedroom door on the left at the top of the steps, the door's open, the lights are on, and I said, I can't believe how well they're playing in there. They're, I haven't heard them for a half hour, and as I come up, I catch out of the corner of my eye the three of them coming in the window from off of the roof. They were incredibly quiet because they weren't even in the house. And I was like, what, what are you doing? What are you, do, you know, what are you doing? And, you know, they kind of had a laugh. And I was just like, guys, guys, here's the rule. Rule number one, when Uncle Tucker watches you, you don't go out on the second story roof, right? Pretty clear. Well, I knew that I was a steward of these kids. I was entrusted to keep them safe. And for a split second, I thought I had failed, right? Now, interestingly enough, when the parents had left, they didn't say, oh, by the way, you're going to watch the kids tonight. You own them, right? I wasn't the owner of these kids. I was just a steward. I was, just, I was entrusted to take good care of them. The funny part of this story to me, I mean, that was kind of funny, but the funny part is when the parents got home. They said, how was your night? I was like, well, it was interesting. I said, well, what do you mean? I said, I told them the story, and they laughed. And they said, oh, yeah, they've been doing that lately. I'm like, you could have shared that, you know, like I would have known, right? This idea of ownership and stewardship is something that I'm going to argue we get wrong all too often when it comes to our finances. And when we apply the wrong perspective and we act as though we're the owner, it gets us stuck. It leads down a path that leads to becoming stuck. When we talk about these two things, here's things that, kind of the way I like to describe it. An owner, the definition of an owner, right? An owner can do what they want. The only desired in, uh, outcome is that of the person. They have 100% stake in just doing their own thing, right? Whereas a steward is called to an entirely higher ethic. A steward shares responsibility for someone else's desired outcome. Uh, another example, in my day job, I'm a financial advisor, right? So people come to me and they say, we trust you with our life savings to help bring about the goals and objectives and their outcomes, right? That's what a steward looks like. It's not an owner. They don't come to me and open an account with me and I go, well, that's nice. I own it. It's great. It's all my money. No, you don't do that, right? A steward is called to a higher ethic. I believe God calls us to act as stewards in our finances, number one. I could just say that and end right here because it's literally that simple, right? We are not, even though our names are on the paycheck, we, it's not our money. Who gave you the job, right? Who gave you the ability to work? Who let you wake up this morning, right? He's entrusted us with resources, and he says, I'm going to bless you with these resources. Now, what are you going to do with them? I want you to share in my desired outcome for this world. And are you doing that or not? I want to take you to a story in Matthew 25. Uh, we'll put a few slides up, but I encourage you, if you have the Pew Bible um, or the worship folder, it's in there. But if you have the Pew Bible, turn to page 983. And while you're doing that, I want to give you a little bit of context about this, um, about this story. This is the story, the parable of the talents. And a lot of you might have heard this. Jesus liked to, to teach with stories that were to, to drive home a point that were easily relatable to. And so he's sharing this story that we'll talk about here in a second to his followers, and he's trying to make a point. And sometimes to find the point of what he's saying, it's in the story, but you also need to look at the context, all right? The context of Matthew 25 it starts with the parable of the ten virgins, right, who are told to look for the bridegroom, to, be, to wait, to be prepared for when the bridegroom arrives. It's a story and a parable about preparation, about waiting for the return of Christ, and that we should be prepared for that. 
okay? At the end of the chapter, Christ speaks about the coming end times when he returns and the judgment that's going to be taking place, right? This whole chapter is trying to get people prepared for the coming of Christ and what should be done while you wait. And right in the middle is the parable of the talents. This is the part that's saying, God, that God is saying, this is what it should look like while you wait, okay? So if you turn to it, verse 14, I'm just going to read this through. And it says this, it says, again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. There's that word entrusted. That's a key term, right? He entrusted his property to them. He didn't just give them a gift and then leave. He didn't say, hey, I'm going on a journey. Here's some money. Go do what you want with it. He said, no, no, I'm going on a journey. I need someone to watch over my uh, important possessions while I'm gone. Here it is. I'm entrusting this to you. To one, he gave five talents. Now, let me stop there for a second. Some versions will use bags of gold. Others will say talents. This passage is preached a lot around more than just money, okay? But just so we're clear, a talent in those days was an order of money. It was a large sum of money, right? So while this works to talk to you about using all of the resources God's given you, there was a clear intent in this passage to talk about what you do with your money, okay? Talents were a huge sum of money. Think about a talent as a huge bag of gold, okay? That's a good equation. So think about it that way. To one, he gave five talents or five bags of gold, of money. To another, two talents to another one talent, each according to his ability. That's interesting. We'll come back to that. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with the two talents gained two more. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you've entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. Another way of saying that is, you've recognized my desired outcome. And you've been faithful in that. You've taken part in that. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with the two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Then it gets interesting, right? We get to the player in the story that I would argue is stuck, who has the wrong perspective on what to do with the master's money. It says, then the man who had received the one talent came. Master, he said, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid, and I went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. In other words, he's almost proud of the fact that, look, I didn't lose anything. Here you go, right? The master replies, you wicked and lazy servant. And I like this, la this next line. It says, so you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed, question mark? He calls his bluff, right? He says, you're going to use that as an excuse? You think I'm really a hard master? Let's think about this for a second. I actually entrusted you with one of my valuable possessions. I'm not a hard servant. I wouldn't do that. I actually gave you opportunity. I'm not a hard servant. You knew what I was expecting of you, and yet you chose to not follow through. Well then, he said, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. That's the least you could have done. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has 10 talents for everyone who will be given, I'm sorry, everyone who has will be given more and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Very graphic illustration. And remember the context. This is Jesus trying to tell you that, hey, while you're waiting and preparing for my return, I want you to be good stewards. I want you to share with me in my desired outcome for the world. That's the definition of being a good steward. And I, and I think this through a little bit, and, 
And it's fascinating to me that not all were given the same opportunity, right? Think about it for a second. The master had three people that he gave the talents to, right? He gave out a total of eight talents. So think eight bags of gold, right? He got back 15. For you math, you know, meticians in the room, that's an 87.5% rate of return. And interestingly enough, he nailed it. The one he gave five brought back five. The one he gave two brought back two. The only one that didn't perform was the one he gave one, right? Unbelievable allocator of capital, right? If he had given the five to the one who wasn't going to perform, his return would have been significantly lower. It, to me, it implies the master in this story knew who was going to be able to perform and who took this responsibility seriously. If you think about that for a second, apply it to our own world. This isn't prosperity theology. This isn't saying, hey, if you give, God's going to make you rich and wealthy. That's not the point. But it's very possible that you're stuck in your finances because God looks down and says, I can't trust them with more. I truly can't. They've not demonstrated any ability to take part in what I'm trying to do in the world, right? I would argue that the way to get unstuck and the way to step forward into being a good steward is to every day acknowledge that you're spending, you're saving, and you're investing someone else's money. Imagine just that little change, that little nuance, how it might impact the way you spend money. When you go to make a large purchase and buy a large screen TV and you say, is this the way that I should be investing God's money? Is this a good investment? Now, before you all go crazy and say, oh, he's telling me I can't buy a big screen TV. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is in the context, how faithful have you been, right? How are your priorities straight? Have you invested in the kingdom? Have you done all these things to kind of give you the ability and right to buy that big screen TV? Or the second you get that paycheck, are you running out and buying the big screen TV and then realizing that you suddenly have nothing left to be a good steward with, right? Which, which is your situation? Now, some of you, um, well, let me take a step back. I want to spend the rest of the time going through some real practical tools to try to help you become better in stewardship and also to get unstuck if you are stuck or more importantly, hopefully, to keep you from getting stuck in the first place. But before I do, some of you might be sitting here and saying, man, I'm in church. You're beating me up about finances. I'm already feeling guilty enough. I don't need you telling me that I don't need, you know, mountains of debt. I already have it. And what do I do about it? And, you know, you're just feeling guilt, guilt, guilt. And I just want to encourage you and tell you and share a couple of things with you first. Number one, no matter where you are right now in your finances, right this second, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you whether you put a dime in the offering plate or not. In fact, he loves you so much that he came and died for you, knowing full well in advance how good of a steward you would be. He didn't die for you because he thought you were going to be a good steward. He died because he loves you, okay? That's really important. Second, you're not alone. You might be sitting there going, nobody here can possibly understand the financial situation I'm in. And that's not true. You know how I know that? Because we run regularly at this church a, a, a course called Financial Peace University, FPU. You'll hear it talked about a lot, right? It's a 10-week course that helps teach you about financial stewardship, how to budget, how to pay down debt. I'm going to share a couple of the principles today with you. But guess what? That room is full all the time. You are not the only person out there who's saying, I don't know what, you know what I can do with this stuff. Nobody understands it, and quite frankly, I'm too embarrassed to share it. No, no, no. You need to be in community around this, and you need to understand that you can get out of your financial situation and get unstuck, and other people are doing that with you. Third, there's always hope. Do not get discouraged. I heard a quote that said it this way, Quote, if the God of the universe counts the hair on my head, then he already knew how little was in our bank account and how far stretched we were, All right? You worship and serve a big God. He can help you get out of this. 
financial situation. Don't be discouraged. Baby steps can help you get your finances under control. All right, so let's talk through some practical things that I believe are critical, and I call it the five uh, traits of a good steward. These are things that I would encourage you to write down. Um, I would encourage you to use them as a litmus test to kind of ask, hey, how am I doing on this? But also um, take hold of some of these tools and let them be your, your baby steps to kind of get on. Number one, a good steward acknowledges that you're not the owner. It's basic. If you can't get through that, then the rest of this, you know, isn't going to matter. You've got to acknowledge that you're not the owner. Again, go back for a second. You know, I'm sitting at my desk as a financial advisor, and you walk in and say, here's my life savings. I'm turning it over to you. What are you going to do with it? And I said, well, I don't know, whatever I feel like it. Well, well, what do you mean? Why would you say that? Well, it's my money. It's not my money, right? You'd never work with an advisor like that. You'd say, that advisor is not a steward. That advisor is a criminal, right? Um, in fact, we have, you know, a couple years back, a guy by the name of Bernie Madoff. Anybody, you know, heard of that? That's exactly what he did. He said, you're going to give me your money? I'm going to do what I want with it. It's my money, right? Not a good steward. You can't be a good steward and not acknowledge that it's someone else's, that, that part of being the steward is acknowledging you're taking part and have responsibility in the desired outcome of someone else. Number two, a good steward can account for where the money is going and what it's being used for. Can account for where the money's going and what it's being used for. Now, some of you right there are like, okay, it's getting a little too close to home. You could stop at any time. But the reality is, how many of us actually track our spending? Some, but a lot of us don't. I'm amazed at how many people I sit across the desk from and say, hey, you're going to retire? Great, how much do you need to spend a year? And they go, I don't know. I'm like, well, what do you mean you don't know? How much do you spend now? I'm not really sure. Okay, well, let's start small. Like, how much do you spend on, you know, dining out? Uh, I don't know. If it's there, I spend it, right? Flip that around for a second. Again, you hire me as your advisor, and this is not a commercial. I'm not, that's not what I'm saying. But you hire an advisor, and you show up periodically to check in on how things are going, and the, and the person says, Hey, you're doing all right. And you say, oh, good. I'm glad to hear that. Well, how am I doing? Eh, I don't know. I'm doing okay. Well, where, okay, well, where's my money? I, you know, I don't know. I put some somewhere and something's over here. You would never go for that, right? A good steward inherently knows that, hey, if this isn't mine, right, I need to be able to track and spend it. Go back to the babysitting analogy. What made me so scared, aside from the safety of the kids, was I realized for a big part of that time I was watching the kids, in hindsight, I had no idea where they were, right? I was not being a good steward. I wasn't taking care of what was given. You need to be able to track where the money's going. How do you do that? A couple tools. One, we talked about FPU, Financial Peace University. I highly encourage you, if anything today resonates and you need some help getting through it, you want to dig deeper and learn, sign up for it. It's a great class. You're going to learn some really good things. Even if you think you have it down cold, it's a great refresher. And more importantly, if you're married or engaged or, you know, uh, with, uh, your, uh, with your future spouse or your existing spouse, go together, right? Finances are a huge source of problems within marriages. Go together. Talk it through. It'd be great. Another resource for you, envelopes.com, the letter envelopes.com, okay? This is an online budgeting uh, software. You know the old envelope system, right, where someone would come home with their paycheck, they'd put their cash in the envelope? They would know, hey, my grocery budget, you know, my grocery envelope has $1,000 in it. I just went to the, to the grocery store. I had to take some cash out. What do I have left? Great system. Problem was you're leaving cash all around the house, right? Envelopes does it all electronically. So it sees your bank register. Every transaction that comes up on your credit card or your bank register, any account you give it access to shows up and you have your electronic envelopes that are funded, and you drag it, you know, your ShopRite purchase, you drag it over to groceries, and your grocery envelope drops. It's a great way. You proactively know, A, where I'm spending my money, and also, how much do I have left in my dining out budget? All right? Really important. Another one, Quicken, very popular one. You know, again, I'm not here to tell you one's better than the other. My wife and I, we use envelopes. It works better for us. Um, but Quicken, track it, 
Put in your receipts. See where it's going. You should be able at the end of every year to print out a report that says, this is exactly where I spent my money. And I guarantee you, at the end of the first year, you will be shocked. Don't get discouraged. That's part of the process. It's part of the waking up process to realize, holy cow, I was more stuck than I thought I was. Right? No way for you to get unstuck unless you know what you're doing with your money. A good steward knows where the money's going and what it's being used for. Third, a good steward uses debt responsibly and seeks to have none. Right? Debt can absolutely make us stuck and hold us down. Okay? Now here, I want to give you a little bit of a caveat. Some people would say you should have absolutely no debt, no mortgage, no anything. And I would say that's a great goal to aspire to. I also recognize we live in the Northeast. It's a little hard to have a house, you know, generally without a mortgage. So I'm going to differentiate between your mortgage and the rest of your debt. But what I am going to say is if you have a mortgage and you're a steward, you better still approach that mortgage responsibly. And you better not have a mortgage that's too large for you to handle just because you know, you were told you could afford it or the like, you need to figure out what can work for you and keep it under control. But for your other debt, you want to seek to have none and you want to seek to pay it off as well as you can. Proverbs 22, 7 says this, the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is a slave to the lender. Literally, the slave imagery of you're stuck to the lender. So think about it for a second. You have a lot of credit card debt and you know that you want to be able to be a good steward and give back, okay, that's all well and good, but your number one priority, unfortunately, at that point is to the lender who lent you the money. You've got to pay that debt back first. You literally are stuck in that situation. So I want to talk to you about a little tool. If you go to FPU, you will see this tool. This is a Dave Ramsey tool. I did not create this. It's called the Debt Snowball. If you're looking for a way to get out of debt, this is a really good, powerful tool if you're committed to it. All right, so look at this example for a second. I just made these numbers up. Um, this is somebody who, who has four different debts. I don't include their main loan, their main mortgage. This is just four. And here's the principle. Take out a spreadsheet or a piece of paper, list all of the balances that you owe in order of size, smallest to largest. Forget about interest rate. Common wisdom says pay off your highest interest rate first. Forget that. Go after the smallest balance first. List smallest balance to largest, okay? And then list your minimum payments. And here's the ask. If you truly want to get out of debt, you need to find $200 extra a month. And if you say, I absolutely can't get $200, do it with $100. But I'm telling you, get $200 extra a month, right? It's like literally like three cups of Starbucks. That's all it is. It's not a big deal. Everyone can cut that out. Find $200, eat out a little less, uh, don't go to Starbucks as much, find it. And take that $200 and apply it to the minimum payment on your smallest balance. So in this case, right, add $200 to the 30 uh, minimum payment on your credit card. So instead of paying 30 a month, you're going to pay 230, right? Well, with that size credit card balance, it's going to take you a little less than 10 months to get it paid off. Now, what happens next? That's paid off. What do you do? Well, that's gone. Now I'm going to take the 200 extra plus the 30 from the minimum payment. And I'm going to add that all to my next big minimum payment. So now I'm going to pay 430 a month on the $8,000 car loan. See how that works? And we're going to knock that out. What happens next? After a year and a half or so, that gets knocked out. Now we've got $430 a month to, to play with extra the two minimum payments plus the $200, right? Add it to my minimum payment on my student loan, and look, I'm going to be paying $680 a month off on that where before I was paying $250. And boom, knock that out, you're down to the last one, and all of a sudden you've got $680 to add to my $300 payment to get to my home equity loan. These numbers are not magical. I just made up the balances, okay? But when you lay it out and you get focused and say, I want to become debt-free, this is a tool that can absolutely do that and help you track it. And it will literally start to snowball faster and faster. A good steward uses debt responsibly and seeks to have none. Fourth, a good steward invests in the kingdom. Invests in the kingdom. 
And this is the one that most of you are like, I knew we were going to get here, right? You're going to ask us for money. It's not my point. My point is, if you truly are acting as a good steward and you're saying, God, you've entrusted me with stuff, I want to use it for you, then that means you're going to take part in his desired outcome over yours. And his desired outcome is that his kingdom grows and it expands. In fact, when you go into the end of chapter 25, we don't have a slide of this, um, but when we go to the end of chapter uh, 25 and, and Jesus talks about the sheep and the goats and the end times, um, in verse 34 it says, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? The king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whoever did this for one of the least of these brothers of mine did it for me. Jesus goes on to show what's important to him. And the kingdom and others and investing in growing people's love for him is very, very important to him. So I'm going to ask you, as a steward who's been entrusted with God's wealth, are you investing back in the kingdom? I'm going to throw out a challenge for you. And I'll be honest, there's no way I'm going to follow up and check on this. I'm not going to come back next week and say, hey, how'd you do? Did you do it? Did you not do it? Or, you know, anything. This is totally on you. But here's my challenge to you. I challenge you to go home, preferably later today. Eagles don't play till 4.30, so you've got a little bit of time. Go home and pull out your tax return from last year. You might say, well, I don't know where my tax return is. Well, you're not doing too well on point number two then. You've got to be able to track and know where your tax return is. Find your tax return and look at what your gross income was for last year, okay? You don't have to share it with anybody. Sit down with your spouse or do it on your own, but find your gross income for last year. Now go to the line where you list what your charitable contributions were. And this isn't even about central. I'm talking all your charitable contributions. And take that number and divide it by your gross income. You need to know what percentage you're actually investing back in the kingdom. If your average for Christ followers, it's less than three. Less than three. Less than three percent of Christ followers' income goes back to investing in the kingdom. Now, if you say, well, that's good, Tucker. I, I did it, and I know I'm five or six, so I'm double average. I'm great. That's not the point, right? The point isn't to say, hey, you get off the hook, and you're great. No, the point is to say you need to be aware of how much you're investing back in the kingdom. A lot of you put more in your 401k than you do investing in the kingdom. Think about that for a second. A lot of you are more concerned with your retirement than what goes on in the kingdom in the here and now. Now, I'm not saying saving for retirement's bad. I've literally built a career around it, right? It's important. But what does that say about your priorities? What does it say when you say, man, I can't give back, I can't do what I want to do, and yet you're saving for some distant goal that, quite frankly, you don't even know if you're going to wake up tomorrow, right? Do you invest in the kingdom? Find out the percentage, number one, but here's the real challenge. I'm going to challenge you next year, I want you to raise that number by 1%. 1%. I'm not telling you to go give double digits. I'm not saying make some radical, you know, lifestyle change. I'm saying go out there, raise it by 1%. If you find that you're given three this past year, next year give four. You say, well, I can't do that. That, you know, that's extra money. I'm stretched. How big is your God? How big is your God? Honestly, do you think he's going to leave you hanging because you're investing in what he wants? I don't think so. Last point. A good steward has unity with their spouse around financial decisions. And if you're not married, fine. But I would encourage you to have somebody in your life that you can talk to about big financial decisions. Somebody you can bounce it off. Might be a parent, might be a friend, might be a coworker that you trust. But you need to have unity around your financial decisions. 
and specifically to you, you who are married, we all know that finances are a huge uh, area of stress in finances. This one thing can literally change your marriage. Because all of you come at this and say, well, yeah, but I want this. And I'll give you a quick example. I wasn't planning on sharing this, but early on in our marriage, we needed a car, or I thought we needed a car, and I wanted to get a new Jeep. And my wife likes to, she knows this about me. I obsess about cars. I love cars. I spend a lot of time thinking about them. And so for like six months, I had all mapped out. I was going to buy this Jeep. I knew it. I loved it. It was going to be great. We didn't have kids. We'd like have the top down and it'd be like make our weekends, right? It'd be awesome. And I remember my wife all along was just like, I don't know. I just, it just doesn't feel right to me at this point. And like I begrudgingly was like, oh, okay, all right. You just don't want me to be happy, you know, okay. And, and I, we didn't get the Jeep. It was the best decision we ever made. And I, I give her credit for that. It wasn't, it, if it was left to me, we would have gone this direction. But if I had just like forged head and said, no, 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 I'm a financial advisor. I know we're getting a Jeep, right? How would that have worked out when one of us wasn't even fully committed to a major purchase that you're making? You, a good steward will have unity with their spouse. God calls you to unity in your marriage. It matters for your finances as well. Let me just close with this. Some of you are like, okay, this all sounds really good, but man, I'm really struggling with this, and I don't know, and I'm just here to tell you, you're not alone. Even in the Old Testament, the Israelites struggled with this very same thing. The Israelites were called by God to tithe off of their first fruits and to give back, and we find out that they weren't actually doing it. And in Malachi 3, verses 8 to 10, I want to leave you with this. Just listen to these words. This is one of the most direct pieces of scripture you will find. There's not a lot of extra, you know, interpretation of this. It's right in your face, and I love it, because I don't know about you, I love it when God's clear, right? And it's hard to argue with. So listen to this. He says to the Israelites, will a mere mortal rob God, yet you rob me? But you ask, how are we robbing you? So imagine that for yourself right now. God's saying, are you kidding me? You're robbing me. And you're like, God, what are you talking about? How are you robbing me? He goes on to say, in tithes and offerings, Listen to this. You're under a curse, your whole nation, because you're robbing me. That's a really critical point. He says, there are ramifications for you holding back, right? You are not receiving the blessing that you are av that's available to you by holding back. You're robbing me, and you're under a curse. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this. Test me in this, God says. He says, bring it on. You test me, says the Lord God Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to store it. How great is that? You might be sitting there right now going, hey, I'm stuck. I hear you. This is all great stuff. I can't do it. I am stuck. You have some tools. You can make baby steps. You're not alone. But more importantly, you can trust in God that if you're willing to step out and maybe even give him a little bit and invest in the kingdom, a little bit of that money that you think you can't afford, you know what he says? He says, you test me and you see if I don't stand up to that test. Next year, if you're willing to give 1% more, I can't wait to see, and I hope I hear stories about how God threw open the gates and flooded you with blessings because you were faithful and you will experience God in a whole new way. And isn't that what this is about? Isn't this about us growing in our understanding and relationship to God? That's what this is about. It's not about the money. It's about experiencing God in a new way in your life. I don't know any other clearer way that you could step out and find God than trusting him with your finances. Try it next year. Try it this year. Don't even wait. Invite God into your life. Confess to him that, hey, God, I've been an owner. I've been acting like this is all mine. It's time for me to start acting like this is all yours. Invite him into your finances and see what he can do and see if that doesn't move you from a place of being stuck into a place of being unstuck. Pray with me, please. Lord God, I just confess and we confess that all too often you've, given us stuff and you've blessed us and yet we turn around and we act like it's all ours. Lord, I pray that today 
You'll change that in us. Just change our perspective. Help us to realize that the money we spend, the investing we do, everything, Lord, we do it because it's yours and that you have some goals and desires for what we do with that. May we surrender to that. Lord, give us the hope to not get discouraged in our finances. I pray that we take baby steps and we move towards a place of being unstuck and that we experience you in a whole new way because of that. Lord, thank you that you give us the ability to take part in your kingdom work. Lord, it's an awesome opportunity and I just pray that we don't squander it, that we embrace it fully and experience you along the way. In your name, amen.